I got to go to the new Chick-fil-A in Clifton Park for the first time recently. It was very good. But you know that. You know it's very good. But the hype is still a bit much, isn't it? I mean, it's very good. But people get very excited about Chick-fil-A. Do you remember that not that long ago, the only location that we had was in the Albany airport? I heard a fascinating story from a parishioner about something his workplace did in those days. He works a little bit south of Saratoga. And he said that one day somebody said, I just can't believe that we can't get Chick-fil-A, that it's in the airport. And so they cooked up this plan. And one of them got a one-way ticket to Newark and went to the airport right before lunch with a big duffel bag, got his boarding pass, went through security, went to Chick-fil-A, ordered lunch for everyone in the office, put it in the duffel bag, and walked out to his car and drove back to work. (laughs) By the time they divided the cost, everybody just paid like $8 on top of the cost of the meal, and they had Chick-fil-A brought right to them and he got to be the hero of the day. Now that's commitment. That's just a small example of what committed people will do for the things they care about. If we want something bad enough, we figure it out. Life has always been that way. That's how we're made. So we have to figure out what our first priority is. And once we know that, we know for sure. We'll be able to figure it out. That's how we're made. There is a math lesson that has been duplicated in schools all over the world. It's a way to teach kids about volume. And it goes like this. You just put a glass beaker on a table. And next to it, you put some rocks about fist size, some gravel, some sand, and a pitcher of water. And then this is what you do. You say to the kids, how do we fit all this stuff into this one glass jar? What the most natural thing for people to do is, is to start with the sand and the water and then to put everything else in. But it won't work that way. There's not enough room if you do it that way. The lesson with volume is the big things go in first. You put the big rocks in first, and then there's lots of space. There's gaps all in between the rocks. So then when you put the gravel and the sand and the water, there's room for all of it. But you got to start with the big stuff. That's what has to be first. And that's what we're hearing about in the gospel today. The Pharisees and the Herodians are being bullies. They are trying to trap Jesus. They're trying to make him look bad. They're trying to discredit him. It's, it's a political situation, essentially. But they're asking, we can't possibly fit everything into this jar. How do you tell us to do this, Jesus? And he is saying, very simply, put the big stuff in first, guys. The big things go in first. The way you do life is you figure out what's important, and you start there. And the other stuff will fit in where there's room. But you don't start with that stuff. You start with the big stuff. We're in the next section of the book that we've been reading together, Rediscover Jesus. And this section, as you'd expect, is getting a bit more challenging, offers us a little bit more perspective on how we can up our game a bit. And the question that it presents to us this week is, If we were ever accused by a bully of being a Christian, if we were ever put on trial for following Jesus, would there be enough evidence to convict us? If someone said, I think she's a Christian, or I think he's a Christian, if we were brought before a jury and had a full investigation, would it be true that we really are? Would would the jury say, Your Honor, we don't even need to deliberate? The evidence is overwhelming. This woman, 
This man is a Christian. Look at them. It's written all over them. Throw the book at them. They're clearly a Christian. In order for that to be true, if the jury were to have a unanimous verdict, our big rocks would have to go in first. The big things have to be first. Because they wouldn't say that if our priorities weren't focused on what Jesus wants for us first. If that's just what we leave over, if there's room or there's time, then, then it would be a much harder deliberation for the jury. If someone followed us around to determine if we were following Christ, they could actually save themselves a lot of work by focusing on two places. And it's the same two places where we can do a little self-audit anytime we want. Anytime we want to know what our priorities are, we can look back over the last three months at our calendar and at our online banking statement. It'll probably tell us a lot. Maybe your credit card does that too. It gives you a little pie chart that says, here's what you're spending it on. Oh, look, entertainment, 79%. Right? That, that pie chart is a great piece of evidence. That would be admissible in court. Because it's saying, where is my priority? Does my bank statement show, oh no, I really care about a lot of things that Jesus cares about? Or is it, is it focused on other things? Is my calendar dotted with things that show what I care about? Does it have moments like, oh, prayer for peace at one o'clock in the Middle East? It, does it have things like that? Moments of prayer, moments of service. Oh, look, they spent all Saturday morning in a clothing drive for people in need. When we see that in our calendar and we see those items in our bank statement, we go, huh, yeah. I see where the big rocks are. I see what's most important. I read a story this week about a restaurant in Tokyo that has one day a week, one day a month rather, where they are known to everyone in Tokyo as the restaurant of mistaken orders. And the reason is, one day a month, this restaurant gives all the staff a day off and hires people with dementia from nursing facilities to come in and act as the servers. And everyone knows it's happening. It's the night of mistaken orders. And the reason they do it is because Japan has the oldest culture in the world. They have more elders per capita than anywhere else, and six million people there have dementia. And so, This was an idea that the restaurant owner had with the social worker at the local nursing home to have people be able to one day a week be able to engage with others, to be able to do something productive, and to be needed. And so if you go there on that night, there's a good chance your order is going to get messed up. And it's not going to be cooked the way you ordered it, or you're not going to get anything close to what you ordered. And everybody loves it, and the line is out the door. If that restaurant owner were investigated to find out what is the big priority for this person, are they all about profits only? Clearly. The evidence is overwhelming. What matters to them is not just efficiency. It's not just the bottom line, but but people. And just think of what it does to the nervous systems of the people who go there all of us in this rat race kind of way of living, who know tonight everything's going to be slow and messed up. And I came here for that. And it's going to feel so good to not be on the hamster wheel for one night. This week, we are being asked if we can tell the difference between the big rocks and the pebbles in life. Are we clear on what goes in the jar first? If we were ever dragged into court, accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict me?